to go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'll be there in a minute. It was, or 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you would, please. It was four months ago, and we had just celebrated Emmanuel Sunday. Uh, we had just baptized a 70-year-old and a 17-year-old, uh, quite a day. And I then spent an entire week, an entire week in prayer and in the Word of God, and it was a much-needed boost uh, for my heart as I sought the Lord regarding our hearts. And it's during this time I came across a song entitled, Jesus is Mine, and considered that as a theme uh, for this year. Obviously it is not, so I didn't settle on that, um, but I do want to teach you that song. During this time, I also came across Psalm 31, 23, uh, which we read a moment ago, which says, O oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints. And also thought about making that our theme. My heart just became increasingly moved by his love for us and how we should love him. And it began to be my prayer that we would fall in love again. That we would fall in love with Him. That we would fall in love with one another. And that we would fall in love with His mission for our lives. It was during this time that I read through First and Second Corinthians. And I wish I could take it all I read, but I can't. In fact, we'll read a few verses this morning and, and we won't touch it the rest of the morning. But I want you to look at a few passages. Look in First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4. I'm going to read through first, verse 9. I thank my God always on your behalf. This is Paul to the church at Corinth, a church that was not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Had a lot of issues, actually, interpersonally. And Paul said, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift. Your life doesn't lack anything you need to bless the church. Even, that says, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I wrote a note in my other Bible, my reading Bible, and said, I love this. God gave me everything I need when I came to Jesus. And further, the church has everything she needs in our Lord Jesus Christ. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Obviously, 1 Corinthians 13 is the iconic chapter in the Bible on love and talks about how you can be a well-versed, well-spoken individual. You can be a chair or a an individual who gives of yourself to others, who sacrifices to feed the poor, um, to be a martyr. But if you do not have charity or true gospel love, then it it profits you nothing. You're nothing without love. And the chapter goes on to explain what love is not and what love is. A wonderful study. I encourage you to take your time to walk through it sometime. But you look in verse 13, then it says, And now abideth faith, Hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity, is love. And then verse 1 of chapter 14 says this, follow after charity. Follow after charity. You say it another way, you could say pursue love. And with all these things on my heart and in my prayer, that we would love Jesus Christ, and that we would love one another, and that we would love going with the gospel, I don't think we could have any greater theme. I don't believe we could have any clearer vision. For our 2022, I can't perceive any grander pursuit than the pursuit of love. The pursuit of love. I want you to imagine three kinds of pursuits this morning. Once you, in your imagination, you 
are ducked down in some tall grassland in Africa. And the perspective is through the grass and out through the grass you can see a gazelle out in the open plain there. And you're watching it eat and roam and do what gazelles do. I don't know exactly what they do. I haven't caught up with National Geographic these days. But you realize that your perspective of the gazelle is the perspective of a lion squatted down in the grass and watching the gazelle and waiting for just the right moment to take off. And and there goes the lion out of the grass and begins to chase the gazelle. And it's a full-on pursuit. The gazelle catches wind and and that gazelle's out of there and that lion's after the gazelle. And finally the the lion launches from its back feet or front feet or however a lion jumps. And he's launched in the air and his claws are extended, mouth wide open and it's a pursuit. I want you to move from the grasslands of Africa to Interstate 85. And you're on your way to work. And hope, hoping for a normal commute. And all of a sudden, blazing by at highway rattling speeds that should not be possible for a vehicle, goes this Dodge Challenger. Boom! After you utter an oath... You should have kept in your mouth. Here comes the Georgia State Troopers. Boom, boom, boom. And they're in hot pursuit of the bad guy. They're going to catch that bad guy and they're going to arrest him. Who knows what measures they must use to deploy. Move from Interstate 85 to a college campus. A Bible college campus. Heartland Baptist Bible College. Where I went to college, ironically. In the fall of 2015, and picture this lovely, wonderful, sweet, energetic young lady named Elizabeth Barrett. And she is being pursued by a young man who has fallen head over heels for the first time ever in his life. And she is pursued by yours truly. Now, what do we learn from these pursuits? The grasslands of Africa, that was a pursuit of instinct. It is that lion's instinct to pursue the gazelle to survive. And he will survive, and the gazelle, unfortunately, will not, unless the gazelle outruns a lion. But it's a pursuit of instinct. The pursuit on Interstate 85 is a pursuit of justice. Bad guys should be pursued by good guys. And they should bring them to justice. That's how it should work. That's how God has ordained it. Harlan Baptist Bible College and that college campus there in the fall of 2015, that was a pursuit of love. A pursuit of love. And the pursuit of love... And I'm not talking about romance, although that could fit into this overarching category, this overarching theme. The pursuit of love should be our supernatural instinct of children of God because it is His instinct. And it should be our pursuit, watch this, in a world that cries injustice, it should be our pursuit of true justice in the world because it is how our God pursues justice. And it should be, the pursuit of love should be our soul exhilarating pursuit because our God passionately pursues us in love. So let's start with our God. The pursuit of love means God pursues us. When I pursued Elizabeth, not just anybody did, The pursuit meant something to her because of me. I meant something to her. And the fact that God pursues us should mean something to us because of who He is. 
We were, during our uh, time of quarantine, we had a little extra time around the house. And so we, I was doing, helping Elizabeth with the kids' room, and we were trying to organize their closet, which is probably a weekly thing. And sometimes you get a wild hair, and here comes the purge. And uh, you're doing a deep clean and hanging things up. And I, you can picture the little pink or purple or white hanger and putting Emmy's dress on a hanger or Jack's jacket on a hanger and sticking it up. And Emmy would say, that one doesn't go on that side that woman won't hang her own stuff up but she knows where it goes and she'll tell me about it okay and so you can picture a little hanger and I put a jacket on that and I hang that little jacket up there in the closet did you do you realize you think about the earth Job 26 verse 7 says that God hangs the earth upon nothing you've seen pictures of earth from space Who's ever, who likes to look at pictures of space? And you've likely seen a picture of Earth from space, and it's just hanging there on nothing. And God hung it there. Like hanging up a jacket in a closet. God hung this planet that we're on right now on nothing. Truly, as the writer of Hebrews said, Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. During our time away, Jack and I built a birdhouse together, and I got frustrated with all the little nails I bent. And it was the nail's fault and the soft wood. It wasn't my fault. I didn't hammer a nail. Good grief. (laughs) They didn't ask me to build Snoopy's doghouse. Let's just say that. And my best effort to do a project with my son was this pathetic birdhouse. And don't tell Jack. But what is God's handiwork? What is God's project with his son? Look at space. Look at the sun. Don't stare too long. Look at the moon. Look at all the twinkling stars of the night sky. He commanded, Psalm says, and they were created. He made the stars also. The writer of Hebrews would go on to say, They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment, like a, a jacket or a dress, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. One day I'm wearing this jacket. I love this. is one of my favorite jackets to wear. But one day this jacket will be old. It will be folded up, and it will be tossed. And one day the universe will be old. This universe, it already feels old and it already is old. But it is, it'll be old and folded up and tossed. And it'll be totally changed for something new. And yet God will ever be the same and never grow old. Psalm says, the Lord is king forever and ever. The Lord reigneth. He, he has clothed himself with majesty and strength. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. He is the king eternal, Paul would say to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1. He's the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, who alone deserves honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And he pursues us. That's amazing considering who he is. And that's amazing considering who we are. We take you to Genesis 1 where God created his man in his own image to be like miniature versions of God the king ruling earth and God created the earth for man and he pursues man and yet man on earth chose to pursue himself. He disobeyed God's command and he thought he could be God and he thought, well, I'm just as smart as him. And every man since then has been in bad shape. The imaginations of your heart, of man's heart, is only evil from youth. The story of man in the Bible is a story of ongoing rebellion, whether it was the rebellion of those who were totally anti-God, just God-haters, or it was those who were supposed to bear God's name. We are sinners in need of repentance. We are dead men walking in need of God's life. We are under the power of darkness. 
We are slaves in the kingdom of Satan. We are comfortless, wandering orphans without mercy, without hope, and without God in the world. That is who we are as mankind, as humans. And yet, God pursues us. The story of the Bible is the story of the sovereign, almighty God pursuing rebels with his love. When the world plunged into chaos because of rebellion at Babel, God promised blessing to man and Abraham, saying, In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. When God's people rebelled against their faithful, covenant-keeping God again and again, He said in Jeremiah, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. And in spite of man's track record of rebellion, the Lord has a track record of pursuing man with love. In fact, he pursued man himself as a man. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And Jesus was God's perfect, picture-perfect pursuit of us, Emmanuel. God with us, the Savior of all men, the Lord's Messiah. He was the Word which created all things and the Word which was made flesh to give man grace and truth and power to become children of God. Jesus went to the darkest corners of our world, the darkest corners of man's heart with the light of God. He didn't come to destroy men's lives. He didn't come to condemn us. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to give us life and more abundantly. And he called the worst of society to follow him. And he proved he has power to forgive their sins. He came into the world to save sinners. And he opened the gates of the kingdom of God. God pursues us. And Jesus came To suffer great sorrow for sinners. He was betrayed by a friend. He was forsaken by his followers. He was falsely accused of hating, blaspheming God. He was spat in the face. He was slapped in the face. He was rejected by his people for a murderer. He was scourged viciously by the Romans. He was stripped naked, then forced to wear a scarlet robe and a crown of thorns for mockery. He was crucified as soldiers gambled over his clothes and passers-by mocked him. He was abandoned by his own heavenly Father. And Jesus Christ, God's own Son, died for you. You see the cross on the banners. And how it says Jesus under the cross. And Jesus is God's pursuit of us. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says it so clearly that God commendeth His love toward us. That is present tense. That's a present tense word. That means right now God commends to us. He shows us. He exhibits to us. He puts it on display. God exhibits His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God pursues us. And Jesus' death is the proof of that. But Jesus didn't stay dead. So what good would it be to be pursued by somebody who's dead? Jesus came back to life on East, that Easter morning. He rose again uh, from the dead and that heart began to beat again. And those lungs began to breathe again. And up from the grave he arose and he's alive. And he has ascended and sent us his spirit. And that's why we say God pursues us. Because Jesus sent his followers all over the world to tell people the good news that he died for man and rose again to offer repentance and the forgiveness of sins so that every rebellious man and woman could be reconciled to this radical God of loving pursuit. 
And all who believe this message are saved by him. They're reconciled to him. And God's word, listen, God's word to believers in Jesus Christ is clear. He still pursues us. Half the Bible was written to believers in churches. It's called the New Testament. And God says to us, listen, my pursuit of you was not a one-off. I did not pursue you to eat you like a lion. I did not pursue you to arrest you like a state trooper. I pursued you because I wanted a relationship. And I still pursue you. How many of the New Testament letters have to begin with grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ for us believers to believe this? God pursues us. He calls us his beloved, his elect, his spirit is at work in every situation of our lives. Though we get discouraged, he comforts us. Though we fail regularly, he forgives us. Though we get our disciple wires crossed, he sees what's going on and he speaks to his churches. Our lives, as we read in 1 Corinthians 1, are enriched by him in every way. The Bible is clear that we are God's bride and he nourishes and cherishes us. The Bible is clear we are God's house and he won't stop home improvement projects on what belongs to him. We are God's garden and he'll keep cultivating us to bring forth fruit until he returns. And when Jesus Christ does return, he will gather us unto himself and present us faultless before him with exceeding joy. And he will take us to the place he has prepared for us. And then he will one day dwell with us in the new earth forever. God pursues us, dear believers. He always has pursued us. Look at the cross. And he continues to pursue us, and he ever will. The pursuit of love means God pursues us. It goes without saying that when someone so special to you pursues you, you pursue them back. I can't help but thinking of Hebrews chapter 10 that exhorts us that since we believers in Jesus Christ have the ability to enter God's very presence through Jesus. You think about that. We have the ability through Jesus to enter the very presence of the God of the universe. And so it says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith But draw near in the right way because it says having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed, our lives clean with pure water. He pursues us. So obviously we pursue Him. And we will not miss a single chance to worship Him and hear His word with His people as we are able to do so. We have no other gods before Him, right? Not our careers, not our hobbies, not our families even, not our friends. Nothing comes before God. Jesus taught that loving the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind is the great commandment. And it seems to me that we are commanded to do this because it is the very kind of love God has for us. Can we walk away from the cross with any other idea than that? So let me conclude. You say, well, what about the world, the church in the world? I see you got the church up there and the world up there. Well, it's simple, the pursuit of love. It means God pursues us, Jesus. Jesus is not done with his churches. He's not done with Emmanuel Baptist Church. He is passionate about us and he loves us deeply. And the grace and mercy of Christ is on our life and it's in our life and we can be reminded of it again and again and again and again. That's what the New Testament is all about. You go to Revelation and the the letters to the seven churches from chapter 2 and chapter 3 and he says, I know thy works. I know thy works. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus is speaking to us as we gather. He is at work work in our lives as we grow as disciples and he wants us he wants to go with us as we go with the gospel he pursues us dear people 
God has been in pursuit of Emmanuel for a long time. God brought us together a couple years ago. Prior to that, when, when the church was in a dire strait and the church was in a difficult way, some 20 plus years ago, and this church needed someone to even things out and keep people together and keep things going, God brought a man here named Terry Hart. And when he believed it was his time to step down from this ministry and to retire, God brought another man here. Why? Because God is in pursuit of Emmanuel Baptist Church. God has kept you here. God has brought you here. God has worked in your life in this place. Why? Because he pursues you. He cares about you. He loves you. He's crazy about you. And he will always be crazy about this people right here. And because of that, you know, there's a lot of directions we could go. Since God pursues me, how should I respond? How should I love Him? And we could get into that. I'm going to offer some things to, to, tonight to just encourage you and suggest to you to how, to how can we make sure that when we come to meet with God, we come to meet with God. How every day in my life, it's not about me and my petty, shallow dunghill of interest, if you'd go read Philippians chapter 3, it's not about me and my life. How can every day I return the favor and pursue Him back and love Him back? We can get into that. But what I'm finding more and more as I study the New Testament is that, that as we are so overwhelmed with the love of God toward us that the, the most basic response to that love, if I love Him back, is to love you. It's to love you. And so the pursuit of love means we pursue one another, church. Jack saw that little icon, little people, little three people, and he said, that's a church? Those are people? I said, yes. The pursuit of love means we pursue each other as people. Both in the times when we gather as the church but in times outside of that of fellowship where I'm seeking to have a relationship with you and you're seeking to have a relationship with me and we know each other and we know what's going on in each other's lives and we're praying for one another and we're vested into one another and we're just there. We pursue one another in this world of constant dings and brrr, That's mine. That's my, my vibrate on my phone. It could wake up the neighborhood. And this constant time of communication and all these things. Let me ask you, are you using those tools that God has given us to pursue those within this assembly? We may not meet every day as the early church did. We may not literally come alongside of everyone every day as the early church did. But why would we not, with the capability of communication that we have, why would we not be in contact with some brother or sister in Jesus Christ every day? We pursue one another in love. We pursue one another in fellowship. We pursue one another in prayer. We are growing as disciples in fellowship. You see it? We gather as the church because He gathers us. And He pursues us. And we grow as disciples that's pursuing one another in love. And that will naturally, supernaturally lead to us pursuing the world. If we are fervent and passionate in our lives together about Jesus, we won't be able to help taking that love, taking that gospel that has changed our lives, that is filling our lives, that is making our lives thrive and blossom together as disciples, we won't be able to help but then, then to pursue the world. And not that we're pursuing the world in the sense of, well, I, I, I just love this part of the world and I love that. And, and, and we give ourselves to carnal devotions. No. And this growth cycle in our lives, as we relish and rejoice that God pursues us, and as we pursue one another, this purifies our lives so that we can truly go and truly care for the world and see the world as God sees it. We pursue the world in love. We go with the gospel to the people that Jesus places in your life we pursue the world I want to ask you are you pursuing the God who pursues you am I pursuing the God 
who pursues me. It is my prayer that Jesus, his church, and his mission for us on this world would become our life. And if we are pursuing God with the same pursuit that he pursues us, it can't help but be our life. If you are, if we are as Emmanuel Baptist Church, if we are pursuing him, the other two pursuits will naturally happen. But if we are not pursuing one another in love, and if we are not pursuing our lost world in love, then are we really in pursuit of the God who loves us? It is the pursuit of love. It is the pursuit of love. Please bow your heads and close your eyes. So, musicians, come. Father, we thank you that you love us. God, I, in my own heart, I'm ashamed of my own life, my own lack of love for you. My overabundant interest in self. But God, I thank you that Jesus Christ came and died for me and rose again and that by faith in him, I am dead to selfishness and alive unto God through Jesus Christ. And I pray that we would pursue you and we would pursue one another and we would pursue the world with the gospel. Help us seek you, Lord, as a people. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.